Right before we jump into this video, if you want to get my free 11 days to better photography mini video course, head on over to fronosphoto.com 11 days to get started right now. Jared Poland, fronosphoto.com, and this is a real world review of the Sigma 135 f1.8 art lens. So here we are at the Fro Factory to test out this 135 1.8 that people are absolutely going nuts over and they want to see a real world review so that's exactly what I'm bringing you today. Now my goal with this is to shoot portraits because primarily a 135 is a portrait lens and especially at this 1.8 you should get some really nice bokeh but my test I want to shoot at 1.8 portraits. How close can I get to the subject and still get them nice and sharp and in focus? What will it look like at f8? What will it look like at f11? I just want to try a bunch of different things. So watch, enjoy, and here we go. So I have these awesome windows here at the Fro Factory. We get some nice diffused light coming through the frosted glass. We're actually shooting a little later in the day. In the morning, we get some really awesome sun coming in, but that shouldn't matter here. We have enough light to work with. But I noticed something when I went to do these headshots of Todd. When he looks straight on at me, all I see is an amazing purple reflection right in his glasses. Now this is something that you may have to contend with out there, so though, though this doesn't have much to do with the lens, it has more to do with how you're gonna pose him. One of the only things I can do, because he doesn't have other glasses, is I can drop the chin down. Drop the chin down, Todd, right there. And if I came up a little higher, then I would get rid of that glare. Uh, and if he looked off to the side just a little bit, I would get rid of that glare too. But now, let's get some shots and uh, enjoy watching. All right, right here, straight on. Let's go with the, um, let's see what we've got. Yeah, right there's good. Oh, man, I got nice purple right there. Oh, it's so subtle at 1.8, like, <laughs> wow. With some of the portraits, I wanted to shoot at f1.8 just to show you what it would look like. But what you will notice at those higher apertures is that the background distractions become more prevalent. And of course, at 1.8, you're blowing them out completely. But another thing that you will notice is that if somebody has wrinkles or imperfections in their face and you're tack sharp on their eye, you may not even see those wrinkles or imperfections in the face at all. But as you start going up in aperture, 2, 8, 3, 5, f4, that may become more prevalent in the face and may not make the picture look as good. Turn your chair this way a little bit. Just turn it. There you go. Eyes to me. I mean, at 1.8, I'm, I'm just astonished at how well that hits. Chin down. Oh, wow, that's super tight. So I need to... It's just hard to stand there like that. So how's the hand holdability of this lens? Now, if you work out like me, you could hold it all day long. Not really, I still got pretty tired holding it because it's two and a half pounds. Put that on top of a Nikon D5 and you've got a four pound piece of thing in your hands right there and that's gonna get heavy. So take that into consideration if you're somebody who can't hold things for a long time because of weight or if you just have smaller hands, this may be a harder lens to hold for a long amount of time. Yeah, that's good. Turn, turn, turn this way a little bit. Yeah, right there, and then look right at me. So that's too close, but I can back up like this. Oh, whoo! It's as close as I can get to the eyes. So what is the close focusing distance that you can get with this lens? This is something a lot of people always wanna know. Now, by the specs, it says just under three feet, it kind of felt like I was able to get closer than three feet, but you can see from the images, you can get the eyes in there and part of the nose. I got pretty close to the subject. Now it doesn't replace a macro lens, but it does a pretty good job with letting you get close to your subject and filling the frame. I am astonished at how sharp it is at 1.8, right on Todd's eye. I didn't expect that. Sometimes you feel like you're gonna miss because at 1.8 you're at a super shallow depth of field, but not only does it look super sharp in the eye, but the contrast looks really insane right off the back of the camera. And the camera, the picture style isn't even bumped up that far. So I can't wait to get these raw files into the computer. But what I wanna do right now, I wanna cut down on some of the light in here because I wanna make the portrait a little more dramatic. So I'm gonna 
close some of these blinds. Oh, wow, that's dramatic. Where's the serious? And there you go, that's good, right there. At me, not, not at him. No, come on. Give me the serious. So what I've noticed with this 135 is pretty interesting for a portrait lens. But what you have to remember is that if you were to put this lens on a crop sensor camera, you need to multiply it by 1.5 on the Nikon and 1.6 on the Canon, you're looking at a 200 plus millimeter f1.8, which is pretty insane. Now, I feel that this focal length is really nice for portraits. If you were gonna use it for video, it could be very nice for doing interviews as well. But remember, if you throw it on a 4K camera that's a, that's a crop sensor or where any cropping is happening, it's gonna act as an even longer focal length than the 135, but you'll still have that 1.8 to get that really nice shallow depth of field. So I'm a super big fan of tack sharp focus. And when you're shooting portraits, the eyes, in my opinion, need to be absolutely sharp. Now with Todd, with the glasses on, it was super sharp, but with the glasses off, Sorry. it was even more sharp. It's like it popped right off the back of the screen in just the preview. Put your, put your hands up and look through your eyes. Yeah, that. Step in close. Get your chair again. Get the rolly chair, please. Yep, now head needs to be straight. Push your neck out just a little bit. Like you're e like you're turtling into it. Yep, that's fine. But now that you did that, your head needs you were fine leaning on the elbow. And then push your head out. Yeah. I just have to get the angle. So I think I got a good amount of test shots here inside the factory, but let's go outside and get some natural light photos to see how the lens handles out there. Now I know you have camera gear because you're watching this video, but I wanna ask you, how do you organize and protect it? Well, if you don't know, check out my free app called My Gear Vault. It's the best way to input, organize, and protect your gear so you know what you have and what it's worth. And again, it's absolutely free. You can download it at mygearvault.com. That's fine. Don't look at me, but look out towards the, ha yeah. Let me do that at 1.8. Point, point and wave to somebody. Just point, yeah, yeah. So because we went outside, I was able to have Todd take off the glary glasses and put on a pair of sunglasses. Now when I went to take a tight headshot of him, normally I like to focus on the eye, but I can't see the eye with the sunglasses on, so I focus on the lenses in the glasses. Sweet reflection. That car, that car's in focus. Now what happened after I took the picture is I'm like, wait a second, Todd's out of focus, but what actually happened is the lens focused in on the reflection inside of the glasses, showing the car in focus, which was to the side of me. So you need to be careful when people are wearing sunglasses, especially if you're shooting wider open at 1.8 or 2.5. If you focus in on that and the reflection is what gets in focus, then the people are gonna be out of focus. Yeah, I can't do that unless you take them off real quick. Just uh, latch them into your shirt. Look out. 
Yep. Yeah, I'm just shooting the shoe. Have you run towards me and pass me? Can you do that without hurting yourself? Go ahead. The hypersonic motor should give you fast focusing, but I've seen in a lot of older lenses that are super fast, like the Canon 1.2s and the 1.4s, that they don't track subjects very well. But this is a 1.8 and it's also a 135, but how does it handle? I think it handled really well, especially when Todd was coming towards the camera. Yes, the Nikon D5 does a great job with focusing, but I think the lens kept up very well. After I got done shooting Todd outside, I thought it would be a good opportunity to shoot some other candid type images of Dan working in the garden, as well as some of the flowers or some of the vegetables that we just planted in the garden. From what I can tell from using this lens for the last couple hours here at the Fro Factory is that it handles very well. It looks super tack sharp. The contrast and tones and clarity look really good, at least on the back of the camera, but the only way to determine how well it actually did is to get it back into the computer and see how the files look. So let's go do that right now. So here we are back at the loft to review the final images. And I want to remind you that you can download the full res keepers over on the website as well as sample raw files so that you can pixel peep them yourself. But let's take a look at the images right here in the computer. Ah. <laughs> Obviously the first one that you see right here is uh, major reflections. And we talked about that in the video that you want to be careful with their glasses that there's not major reflections. So. That's what it looks like. So when we move the head like this, look at this image. We're at f1.8, because if you're buying a 1.8, you may want to shoot at 1.8 to see what the effect looks like in your image. Now, you have to remember that we are shooting through a piece of glass and the eye won't be as sharp because this lens is probably, not the lens, but the lens of the glasses is probably not as sharp as the Sigma lens itself. So that's one thing you need to watch for. But I love the effect that I'm getting in this image. You can see that we are focused on the eye and the rest of the face is going out of focus, which kind of makes it look good. So that's a sweet look. The background looks nice and blown out. You don't see any signs or anything else that's in the background that could be distracting. Moving on right here, straight on, this eye looks to be super duper sharp. One eight hundredth of a second, making sure that my shutter speed is fast enough to counterbalance any handshake or hand motion that there may be because this lens doesn't have any optical stabilization. So I'm not afraid to push the ISO, especially for the fact that I'm using the Nikon D5. Now, if you're using any other camera, you shouldn't be afraid to bump the ISO either to give you that shutter speed that you need. If you're hand holding this, you definitely don't want to have a super slow shutter speed when you're trying to shoot at 1.8 because any movement that you get either from your hands or from the subject may cause the image to go out of focus and not be usable because it's at f1.8 and it's such a shallow, narrow depth of field. But I really like how this image turned out. I think I was also testing out the close focus ability of it and it turns out you can get pretty close and it looks good when you fill the frame. So the colors look good, the clarity and the tones look good, so I'm happy with that even at 1.8 because even with my more expensive 105 f1.4, being that it's 1.4, I sometimes miss the eye and hit the eyelash and maybe having this 1.8 gives you a little bit of extra leeway and it may not be too noticeable compared to the other lens, especially this is pretty affordable if you can afford $1,400, of course. Uh, this one shot at f8. Now, the reason I showed you this is I wanted you to see the face, the difference between f8 and then f1.8. You can see focus is here, then the rest of the face blows out in terms of getting out of focus. Also, you don't see that sign in the background, where at f8, you do see that sign in the background and you do see more of the face in focus, but I'm happy with the quality uh, of the clarity of the glass, the sharpness, the focus, and we'll talk more about focus in just a minute. Um, moving on, 
told Todd to get rid of the glasses just to do a shot so you can see how absolutely tack sharp this lens is. Now we all know that in the past some of those third party lenses haven't been super sharp. They've had issues. But in the last five years, Sigma has done a tremendous job in updating their art line of lenses and making them really good and making a lot of pros think, should they pick up this piece of glass and save that money? Now right here, you can see how sharp it is. It handled very nice and at 135, you're getting more compression in the background than you would if you used an 85 1.4 or 1.2 or if you used a 105 1.4. You get more compression because that's what happens with longer focal length lenses. Um, so moving on, as close as I could get, showing you that close focus, you can get this and still get the eyes nice and tack sharp. This is the closest point that I could get to with the autofocus still kicking in. That's your close focus. Uh, let's see, moving on. So here we are outside. Everybody wants to know how does it handle outside? The colors, the tone, the contrast, that all popped really well. Of course, the Nikon D5 doesn't hurt, but most cameras outside in nice daylight should give you that nice oomph, and this lens helps you get that nice oomph. So this is top to bottom. You can see that the background's blown out. I'm at f2.8 this time, just showing you what's happening. Nice reflections in the glass. Actually, the more I look at this image, uh, I'm actually focused. <laughs> I'm focused on the reflection in the glass, which means that this image, he's not sharp. The reflection in the background sharp. That's something you have to be careful about. And I show you that right here. It's focused in on the reflection. So with glasses like this, you really have to be careful because the cameras and the lenses are super sensitive and super sharp enough that they're going to focus in on the background behind you. So just be careful when you're doing that. So I had him take the glasses off. We moved into the shade. We shot at 1.8 and boom. That's sharp. That's really sharp. I just, I just, I look at that and I'm still amazed with the quality of lenses that are being put out today, regardless of being Nikon, Canon, Sigma, Tamron. They seem to be doing a great job at a pretty good price for a professional end lens. Um, how's the autofocus? I lopped off like 20 shots in a row of Todd running, as you saw in the video, and the focus kept up with him. And you don't really think of a 135 prime lens as a lens that you're going to use for action. But if you ever needed to, it does work. And the autofocus followed all the way through. This is the last one that fills the entire frame. It's right on. And that's what you're looking for. Um, 135, autofocus, very good. Showing you some more bokeh outside. Great tones, great color, like that. Moving on, this is the bokeh test. Everybody wants to see how's it look at 1.8. And as we go through here, just watch as the bokeh changes from 2 to 2.2 two, two to 2.5 all the way through. Watch how the bokeh shows up. Because just because you have a 1.8 lens doesn't mean that that gives you the best looking background. That's for you to figure out what is the best looking background. Is it at 1.8 or is it at 16? You figure that out and I've given you these sample images just to check out. It is amazing though what happens as you go through the different apertures. All the way, what did we go up to? So this is 10, that's 11, that's 13, that's 14, and 16, I believe, is the last one. So that's 16. Pretty big difference. Then I moved in tighter. You can just see the same process and see what's happening right there as we go through the different apertures. Wow, look at that. Do you see the difference right here? We went from like a circle. Actually, it's never actually a perfect circle. Never liked that band personally. But you can just see where it pops. It's like, boom, hey, I'm here. Because it's not as bokeh-y. So the big question is, who is this lens for? I think it's primarily for portraits. It's not really that action lens because it is a prime lens. It could be a nice addition to your bag if you shoot weddings and you already have some other lenses and you want to add a nice portrait lens to get some nice effects for when you're shooting the bride or the groom or you want to get some cool artistic shots. This may be a nice option to have in the bag. But the big question is, do you get it if you have a cropped sensor camera? And the honest truth is, I don't think you should be spending $1,400 
on this lens on a crop sensor camera unless you have a full sensor camera that you use as well. Because I think there's other lenses that are more important that you get first. And I like to say that a 70 to 200 range, whether you buy the Tamron, the Sigma, the Nikon, and the Canon versions are much more expensive, or also the Sony's if you have a Sony camera. You just have to look at what lens is right for you for the stuff that you shoot. And I think in a lot of cases, this may be the third or fourth lens option that you add. I'm a big fan of a 24 to 70 and a 70 to 200 or on a DX, a 17 to 50, 17 to 55, or a 70 to 200, because you can do a lot with those lenses. When you start to get more into the specialty angle of it, that's where you look to pick up something like this 135. Now you have to ask yourself on Canon, do you get an 85 1.2? Over a 135, I like this 135. It felt great in the hands and the range that it gave me on the full frame was really nice. Or Canon also has a 135 F2, which I personally haven't tested out. It's a little older. It's also a little less expensive and it's an F2 versus an F1.8. So in the comments, let me know which one would you rather have, a 1.8 or the F2. And on the Nikon side, for me personally, I could use this lens. I would have no problem if I needed to use it on portrait shoots, but I own the 105 f1.4. That would be my choice for a full-time pro because I love having that 1.4 and I found that that lens is super duper sharp for stills as well as for video if you're doing interviews. So I absolutely love that, but it's a trade-off because it's a lot more expensive. At the end of the day, this 135 passed my test. Really happy with those tack sharp images at 1.8. Just be careful when you're shooting. Make sure your settings are spot on so that when you're shooting at 1.8, you can get that nice tack focus which is really important to your images. So that's basically it. Now, if you do have a lot of gear and if you're watching this video, you probably have at least one piece of gear. I wanna know how do you input, organize, and protect it? Well, I created my Gear Vault. It's the best way to input, organize, and protect your gear so you know what you have and what it's worth. It's absolutely free. Go download it right now for Apple as well as Android and let me know what you think of it. And that's it, don't forget, you can download those sample raw files over on the website to pixel peep yourself. And that's where I'll leave it. Jared Poland, froknowsphoto.com. See ya.